So now let's proceed to the next session on a tutorial for different calibrators. I'm Ho Sung, and I'm also from the University of Bristol. So for this session, we will again start with a toy data site since we are effectively introducing a set of tools it will be good that we know all the details that are actually going on and then we will go in we will go through a set of different calibrators and uh, later we will also introduce a few regularization and the Bayesian treatments so that we improve the generalization of the calibrators and uh, some implementation details and the tricks that are going to be useful. And uh, finally, uh, wrap up to give some takeaway messages. So for the toy data side, let's start with a generative view. So for better illustration, we assume a binary generative data side. So this one gives the probability density function for class one. And this one gives the conditional distribution for class two. I, you can also see a few data samples that are drawn for each class. And the left mid, uh, leftmost figure, we give the joint distribution as well as the joint samples. For this generative model, we assume that the class weight are equal. The good thing with a generative model is we can actually calculate the Bayesian optimal model, which is also the known as the true model. That's the probability of class one given the each of the x values. Here, so from later on, we will refer the blue class as class one, and all these prediction curves are for the blue class and the class one as well. Following this, if we keep drawing on the part, if we keep drawing samples for from the same distribution, we can actually further quantify the distribution of the prediction as well. For instance, here you have a prediction around probability of one. This if effectively give you a data point in the prediction space around here. And uh, we keep drawing all the samples from the original feature space. You are actually constructing two distri uh, class-wise distribution for the model predictions. This would be the one for class one. As we can see here, you have a probability prediction close to one, hence give you a peak around 1.0. And around this area, where you have a high dense of data point corresponding to the value of 0 0.5 and vice versa for class two. And the joint distribution will be like shown in the leftmost figure. And then since we actually know the distribution of both class for their predictions, in this example, we will actually calculate the true or continuous reliability diagram. So this is different from what you have seen for the previous slide where we have to rely on binning to calculate the reliability diagram. However, with the toy data side, since we actually know everything, we can effectively calculate the reliability on every single prediction, hence gives a continuous curve. In this particular case, since the black curve represent the prediction of the base optimal or the true model, we have a perfect calibrate model, hence a diagonal in the reliability diagram. So now it's time to further consider the case that we want to train a classifier with this data site. So let's do what most people do in these days. We start with a neural network. In this case, a two-layer multi-layer perceptron with 128 hidden units at each layer. So although we always say that... Thelmo uh, here. Uh, the pointer and, the, uh, and your mouse have, have a little delay. So maybe if you turn the pointer off, uh, 
would be okay. a bit of, sorry. Okay. So, okay, from now on, I will stop using the printer science demo. So if you look at the left figure, so although uh, deep models are known that they can include a very rich function space, but in this particular case, as we can see, the probability outputted from the deep nights can actually be quite different from the true model, particular around the middle area, where it seems that the predicted probability seems to have a bit of momentum from both the red class and the blue class and cause them to quite deviating from the true model. As well, if you check the top right region, the deep model seems to be underconfident and always predicts a lower probability compared to the true model. So now if you check the right figure, which gives the reliability diagram of both the true model and the MLP classifier, it further proves our observation. So if you check the top right region of the reliability diagram, so the corresponding probability is higher than the, for the MLP classifier is higher than the diagonal, meaning the MLP classifier underestimate towards the score or close to probability of one and around the middle area where you see this particular jumping which is corresponding to the area close to 0.5 as well you can further observe that close to the predicted probability between 0.2 and 0.4 you also have the issue of underconfident meaning that your predicted probability is lower than the true probability. So now it's time for us to consider how can we make the MLP classifier or any classifier better in terms of calibration. This is where we need something called post hoc calibrators, meaning that we don't really retrain the classifier, but to consider a model to map from the original outputted probability into a more calibrated probabilities. In this particular case, for the previous model, we need a calibration map that looks exactly as the reliability diagram because it tells us for every individual predicted probability, what is the true probability corresponding to the labels. However, this is a very extreme case because we have a continuous reliability diagram so that we, in this case, the true calibration map will be equivalent to the continuous reliability diagram. However, in, the, in practice, you normally don't have enough data or you don't know the true distribution to calculate the true reliability diagram so that you have to learn this calibration map from some observed data inside of just uh, calculate it analytically. Just uh, another thing to mention, for some calibrators, they also have the name such as temperature scaling or metric scaling. For those of you who already know a little bit about calibration. So it is because it is also common to rescale a real vector output into probability vector space. For instance, there are non-probabilistic models such as SVMs, where the model output is the margins compared uh, to the decision boundary. Or alternatively, you can have the final layer of a neural network before passing it to the, so, uh, to the final softmax activation. So for all these outputs, they are in a real vector space. So you need you can also consider approaches to map them into calibrated probabilities. However, since a real vector and a probability vector can always be transformed into each other. For instance, for the final layer of the neural network, you can use a softmax to put it into the, low, uh, the probability vector form. Or you can just take the probability vector output and take a log it transform to make it into a real vector space. So effectively, all these two approaches, the scaling or probability calibrators can be swapped easily. For just for simplicity, for later slides, we will use the probability vector view by default 
which is the bottom left figure you will see. And the bottom right figure is just a quick view to give you a understanding what it, do we mean by scaling. So if you check the horizontal axis, it's actually from minus 40 to 40, which is in the real number domain inside of a probability output domain. So times for the calibrator session. So calibrators in this uh, tutorial, we will cover a few binary approaches and a few multi-class approaches. For this one listed here, we will give them a detailed introduction. All the approaches here mentioned are quite simple and straightforward to adopt and uh, play for your own tasks. And as a later, we will also give some notable mentions for more advanced approaches and the related approaches that are emerging in the area of machine learning and artificial intelligence among the past few years. For the binary approaches, here we give three key references for later check. So the first one is the, one of the first paper that to consider the isotonic regression model to in the task for calibrating probabilities, as well as the well-known plat scaling, which was designed to give probability output from SVMs, as well as uh, beta calibration, which is recently developed binary calibrating approaches. First thing first, as Telmo has introduced before, we will see binning a lot. So before going other approaches, let's start with the simplest binning case. So for the leftmost figure, you will see a calibration map that is trained with the previous shown MLP classifier with 10 bins. So if you count the horizontal bars, it will give you uh, 10 horizontal bars. So the one of the things to notice here is for empirical binning approach, since we're gathering 10 bins and only output the average probabilities within each bin, this effectively change our out, output space from a continuous probability space into a discrete space. For instance, here you only have 10 different values. In this particular way, you can treat empirical binning actually change a probability estimator into a ordinal model and the ordinal scores will be uh, calibrated probabilities. Then if you check the middle figure, which is the reliability diagram, and uh, the uh, same one will be the uncalibrated model, and the diagonal will be the calibrated reference, and uh, the dot are uh, actually the probability output from the binning approach. As I said, since it it makes the output space becomes a discrete space. You no longer have a continuous reliability diagram, but ten discrete point. However, disregard we only have ten different point. As we can see, all the points are quite close to the diagonal, meaning that at least for these ten output probabilities, we can really trust them to reflect the empirical frequency of the labels. And then we can also check the rightmost figure, which gives us a wheel back to the original feature space. As illustrated, illustrated before, since uh, the output space is discrete now, you will see this piecewise horizontal line. One thing to notice here, if you check the bottom left region and the top right region, you will see that these bars are actually quite far away from the value of one and zero respectively. This is a drawback of having binning to perform binning approaches because you will actually include data samples from other predicted probabilities, hence move the boundaries towards the middle. And uh, on the other hand, if you check the middle area, so binning approach actually does quite well in, this, uh, in the sense that it moves the uncalibrated MLP classifier back to the middle and quite close to the true model. So as in the previous slides we discussed, 
Having different number of bins and the binning algorithm is also quite important to get good results. Here, we give another example. Instead of 10 bins, we have 128 bins. So again, start from left to right. In the calibration map, you will see, although the output space is more dense now, inside of 10 discrete values, you have 128 different values. The drawback is, since we don't have enough calibration site, the, uh, the output probability doesn't really form a clear calibration map curve, but jumping a lot. This can also be seen in the middle reliability diagram. While we have better alliance with the true model around the bottom left and the top right region, where the prob predicted probability are close to the true model, through the middle region, we can see the calibrated probability can actually jump a lot and uh, give some very high variance in the, predict in the prediction. And finally, if you check the rightmost figure, so we observe the same. On certain small regions where the data is quite dense, you can have very good matching between the calibrated one and the true model. However, for different regions, you can see the high variance cause the, the predict probability to jump a lot and uh, give some unwanted artifacts. Before we proceed to the next approach, for those of you who enjoy math more than examples, here are just some quick summary of empirical binning. For the parameters, empirical binning are need a number of m bins where m is a number given by the users. And for each of the bins, you need to remember a number of m bin averages tells you what are the calibrated probabilities is within each bin. So totally, you need a number of three m parameters, two m for bin edges and m for the bin averages. The predictive function is rather simple. You just, uh, for each uh, target probability P, you just uh, determine whether it is in a particular bin, and then you output the corresponding bin averages within that bin. And uh, one of the most important thing is the objective function. So here, as you can see, the way to calculate the bin averages is effectively to match the averages, the absolute difference between the averages on the empirical frequency. So that's what essentially the empirical binning approach is minimized, which can be seen as a particular way of calculating ECE. In this sense, uh, empirical binning can be seen as an approach that actually trying to minimize ECE. Okay, for the next approach, we have isotonic regression. As Peter illustrated, Isotonic regression can be seen as a method based on the Roque convex hole method uh, approach. So let's check the result. So from the leftmost figure, we can see that's the calibration map given by the isotonic regression. Since the isotonic regression used the adjacent pooling algorithm or the Roque convex hole method, a clear observation here is that it will have this piecewise constant manner similar to the empirical binning approach. However, each bin will be automatically decided by isotonic regression during the learning process instead of given by the users. Also, between each horizontal bars, we can also see certain linear interpolation between, which effectively means that the output from the isotonic regression will be continuous but this doesn't necessarily mean the calibration itself, calibration map itself is continuous. For instance, this calibration map curve is, you cannot have its derivative everywhere on the curve. And uh, secondly, let us check the reliability diagram. So from the reliability diagram, we can see actually the isotonic regression does quite well in this case. The dash since now we have uh, continuous output, we will use this black dashed line to represent the reliability diagram for the MLP classifier after calibration. Uh, in general, it's 
quite close to the diagonal, meaning the final result is being close of cali being calibrated. However, you can also see a slight, slightly jumping or artifact that you know, jumps up or right occasionally. This is due to the fact that we apply some linear interpolation between the horizontal bars in isotonic regression, cause some non-continuity, and thus give this artifact in isotonic regression. And uh, finally, if you check the rightmost figure, so we can see the dashed line is already quite close to the grid line of the true model. And for some cases, you don't even, you cannot even distinguish from this two, and the both being quite different from the uncalibrated neural network model. Another thing to notice is that since isotonic regression is a non-parametric approach, it actually can benefit a lot from more training site. So here, we increase the data points 10 times, as we can see, now we have an even smoother calibration map. Although the slight jumping effect cannot be minimized, cannot be totally removed, but it can somehow be minimized. In the middle reliability diagram, you can see also lights jumping around for the calibrated, well, after calibration one. And the similar results can be observed for the rightmost figure for the feature space and the prediction view. So again, for isotonic regressions, these are some summaries. So the parameters, you will have the B edges, which will effectively will be M values uh, in a monotonic uh, manner, and as well as in the age values, similar in a monotonic non-decreasing fashion. And for the predictive function, uh, so you either predict the value within the bin, or you just adopt some linear interpolation. The most important thing is objective function. So isotonic regression is well known to minimize the squared arrow between the prediction and the labels. In our case, since in a binary, yi will be either zero or one as your label. So in this particular case, we can think isotonic reg regression is actually minimizing the Breyer score as introduced by TMO in the last session. So flat scaling. So for those of you who are from, let's say, 20 years, not even, yeah, 10 years or to 20 years ago, when SVM was really popular, this is something probably unavoidable when practicing SVM, which in, let's say in the left uh, figure, we have the prediction for the same two data set from a RBF as we am. Since that we am can predict, can only predict the margins from the support vectors and uh, for each data point, you effectively give the margins from the decision boundary. And here we will see the prediction is between uh, something like minus 1.5 to positive 1.5. So plot scaling is a way to somehow price this prediction into a zero y range so that it will match the empirical probability. However, in this particular case, you will see the plot scaling doesn't do very well. For instance, the top right, the probability never goes up to one. So this is another important message to take. So the power of your calibrator will highly depending on your base model, your uncalibrated model. For instance, if you check the left figure, between the x value from zero to 100, the SVM are actually providing the same margin values, and uh, which means that they grouping all these instances with the same output. So even up after you adapt flat scaling or calibrators in the right figure, this output from these regions will still be kept the same and uh, cannot really go back to the true model where we saw in the previous slide. So just use an analogy, it's more like if you buy a good TV, you can still calibrate it to get have better colors. If you buy a cheap and a black white TV, never expect that you can calibrate it into a full color or you know, even 4K HDR TV.
So just a quick example. So let's adopt plat scaling in our MLP classifier I see in the previous slide. So now to notice for the leftmost figure, the calibration map, in this case, we use the log gate view because we effectively change the probability of the MLP to the final layer or the log gate space. So in this sense, plat scaling, as we mentioned, is just a, a simple logistic regression. And uh, if you check the reliability diagram, since the shape is restricted by the sigmoid shape, it doesn't really do much towards the bottom right region. So the black dashed line is actually on, uh, around the same location as the uncalibrated model. However, it managed to somehow calibrate it the underconfident of the MLP classifier towards the top right region, as we can see the dashed lines is more closer to the diagonal. And uh, similarly, we, we can observe the same, same in the rightmost prediction figure. So towards the top right, the dashed line is moved slightly towards the grid outline, which meaning is being better in the sense that it is close to the true prediction. So plat scaling, I will do a quick view. So it be a, it's effectively a 1D logistic regression on the function output space. So I don't say much here. And the, the objective function is minimizing the logarithm, which is actually the log loss of the logistic, as in common logistic regression. However, to notice, we can swap this log loss into any proper scoring rules, they all give the same properties in terms of uh, optimizing. Uh, however, here we just keep the logarith log loss or logarithm loss for just for consistency with existing literature. Okay, so beta calibration. So we already seen the example in Peter's first introduction slide that when you have a functional function output in a real domain or a real vector, uh, the conditional Gaussian distribution is quite reasonable. However, if you want a calibrator that works directly on probabilities, a finite support and the Gaussian distribution becomes less suitable. By this motivation, uh, uh, beta calibration is proposed inspired by the beta distribution where the support is actually a binary probability space between zero and one. So one of the benefits of such assumption is now we can actually have many um, even richer calibration map spaces. For instance, here just a quick view, uh, beta calibration will have three inside of two parameter in the logistic case, we will have three parameter, namely A, B, and C. So from a first look, you can see we have sigmoid shape here and some inverse sigmoid shape as well. Also, we can, in the middle most figure, we can even have a diagonal map. So meaning that the original model is already calibrated, please do not adjust my probabilities further. Uh, examples. So uh, as illustrated in the previous slide, uh, the power of identity map comes when if the original model is already calibrated, then you don't want it to adjust more. Or alternatively, when no better calibration map can be modeled, it might also be a good choice to stay where it was instead of just adjust things randomly. So for this MLP classifier here, so if you check the leftmost figure, the beta calibrations actually provide a close to diagonal calibration map, particularly towards the bottom left region, where it passes through the 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4, 0 0.4 space. And towards the top left, uh, the beta calibration can also slightly deviate from the diagonal, and then if you check the middle reliability diagram, it achieves a similar performance to fix the top right region where the MLP classifier is underconfident 
and the similar can be observed in the rightmost figure in the filter space. So as introduced in the previous slide, we have three parameters for beta calibration, namely two slope parameter and one intercept parameter, which controls the middle point of the curve. And the beta calibration can be seen as uh, by, by, by variate logistic regression. So you have the logarithm and the, of the P, which is the uncalibrated probability, and the logarithm of one minus P. And then uh, you can just apply a logistic regression case uh, function and the minimize, as in the objective function say, minimize the uh, log loss to fit your parameter. In this case, logistic regression can be, uh, sorry, it's beta calibration can be easily implemented with any existing logistic regression uh, implementations. And uh, for the reason why these two are quite close in their function form, well, you know, one is based on Gaussian assumption, the other is based on the beta, uh, beta assumption. This is something that's shared by the exponential family. Please refer to the original paper if you are more interested. So, okay, time for the multi-class approaches. So for the approaches we cover here are many from two key references. One is the uh, well cited uh, from Guo et al on calibration of model neural networks in almost three, uh, three or four years ago, CSML, as well as uh, one of our recent approach known as the Dirichlet calibration, which was in last uh, year's NIPS or new RIPS now. So since we are now working in a multi-class case, so we can no longer use the previous example. So let us start with adding one more class. So we, if you check the middle bottom of every figure, we add a little bit Gaussian of a green class in the middle, causing the prediction for class one to drop in the middle as well as class two and uh, we will see the predicted uh, probability for class three uh, in the rightmost figure. So we will use this example for the later uh, tutorial. First, so instead of first giving the examples, since now in multi-class cases, it will be better that we first, so we cannot easily visualize everything, so I start with the math, so that you first have a better understanding of the mathematical construction. Then we look at into the visualizations. So the first thing we will cover is the temperature scaling. By the name, uh, it is has only one parameter, which is known as the temperature, which is a real value. So the predictive function is that for each of the class, you take the log, log it of it, namely the probability value P, divide by one minus T, and take the logarithm score. And then you pass it with the temperature scaling and using a soft max. And the overall parameter T can be optimized with log loss and as shown in the objective function. So you just take the derivative with respect to T and do your gradient descent. So now let's check the results. From now on, we only give the top figure, which is the function space view, tells what are the output uh, in terms of uh, the original feature space, what are the uncalibrated model, calibrated model, and the true model, as well as the bottom figure. So the bottom figure is how the calibrator is adjusting the uncalibrated model. For instance, uh, is a probability simplex and uh, the top, the class one, meaning that the uh, uncalibrated unca probability is one for class one and similarly for other classes. And all the right, right regions, meaning that the calibrator is increasing the confidence or the predicted probability for the uncalibrated model. And the more blue, meaning that it's actually reduce the probabilities for the uncalibrated model. And we do that for each of the class because we now have two degrees of freedom. So we can no longer use a single figure to cover them all. 
we no longer use reliability, reliability diagram here. Since reliability diagram is a binary notation, we can either do it in a confidence uh, way or in a class-wise way as introduced by Peter. But both of these are only visualizing the reliability in a binary sense instead of a true multi-class sense, which can be potentially misleading in a multi-class calibrating calibration scenario. So we don't do that anymore. Okay, so come back to the temperature scaling. One of the first thing you can observe is for the bottom figures, they are quite symmetric to each other. This is understandable given that you only have a temp the same temperature scaling, a temperature parameter for all the classes. So effectively, temperature scaling is doing the same adjustment for all the three classes. And now if you check the top, top row, you can see actually temperature scaling is not doing a very well job especially around the middle area and uh, towards the left area, the dashed line are uh, not moving away from the uncalibrated model and quite far away from the true model. That can also be observed from the right most figure for class three, so here is a typo, uh, it's, it should be class three. So the dashed line are almost aligned weights the uncalibrated model and being very far away from the true model. However, if you check the, if you go back to the top left figure and check the region where the probability is close to one, temperature scaling can actually make the dashed line being very close to the true model. So eventually, so as in the original paper by Guo et al, Temperature scaling can be very effective when dealing with confidence calibration. So where you only care the high, highest probability, so the actual predicted class, which we verified in this case. However, it can be quite poor in terms of true multi-class calibration. As we've seen for the rest of the figure, the probability is quite far away from the true model. However, in recent, Trend, we see that some researchers generalize the assumption from Gore's paper to multi class calibration, say, saying that temperature scaling is good. But we, want to correct the, we want to correct this here. It's good for confidence calibration, but not necessarily for true class calibration. So the next is vector scaling. So compared to temperature scaling, vector scaling is a more richer form. So you can understand it in this way, you have a k-dimensional vector parameter w. So effectively, you are having a single temperature for each of the log it dimension, as well as a intercept parameter for every class. And the objective function is actually the same, just uh, minimizing the log loss with the predicted probability and the labels. So examples. So the most straightforward observation is no longer symmetry to each other. So from now on, because we have different temperature parameter as well as a best parameter for every individual class, now we can have uh, different calibration maps uh, or this you know, adjustment for each individual class. However, if you check the results in the top figure, uh, it is still not the best we can have. So for instance, if you check the top right figure, so now the dashed line is pushing towards more to the true model. So you can now see it's no longer overlapping with the uncalibrated model. However, it's still quite far away from the true model, meaning so vector scaling give us a richer calibration map space, but still it limited for a certain scenario. So finally, the matrix scaling, which is the richest uh, form among the three, instead of have a single slope parameter, now you have a k-dimensional uh, vector for each of the class. And uh, you have, if you check the predict function, for each of the class, since you have a k-dimensional slope vector, you have it transpose and multiply the log vector inside of a single log dimension. 
and uh, your miners uh, intercept and pass through the final layer. In this sense, you can think that temperature, uh, sorry, matrix scaling is retrain a final full, fully connected final layer with some fully connected you know, linear parameters. So here you will, because you have K classes and each class has a K dimensional slope parameter. So you are, you are resulting with a K by K matrix. So that's why the name matrix scaling came from. And the objective function, again, log loss, predict probability, labels, gradient descent, everything is done. And uh, finally, the result. So as you probably already guessed, since we have a richer form of parameters, the adjustment in the uh, bottom figure is even richer. So most importantly, if you check the rightmost figure, it has become quite different from the previous case of temperature scaling and the vector scaling. And if you check the top right figure for the uh, function and the feature space view, now we finally see that the dashed line is almost aligned with the true model while being away from the uncalibrated model. Also for other two classes, the dashed line, we can also observe it becomes even closer to the true model, particularly around the middle region. So this meaning that sometimes the, a richer calibration map can particularly compared to temperature scaling, can be actually useful in a multi-class calibration scenario. However, before we move to the next approach, one thing to notice if you check the, uh, the bottom right figure. So where you predict class three with probabilities, as we can see, the other two classes will be close to zero. However, the whole, adjustment or calibration map is filled within the whole simplex. This meaning that actually metric scaling here is trying to adjust the probabilities where you didn't necessarily observe in your training set, which can be a potential issue. And uh, finally, we will solve that with our recently proposed Dirichlet calibration. So if you just check the mathematic form, Dirichlet calibration is quite close to metric scaling. Again, you have a K dimensional slope for each class and a K dimensional uh, slope uh, intercept for uh, the K classes. And the objective function is also similar. Instead of having the original uh, log it feature, what you have is the log log feature inside of the log it. So one of the key difference here is that the log feature is the netto parameter representation for the Dirichlet distribution. As the whole approach is motivated by uh, the Dirichlet distribution. And another important thing is when you do the log it transform, you have to take a reference class and uh, make the log it corresponding to that class being zero. However, with the log feature here, you are effectively treating all the classes equally without making additional assumption on any of the single classes. And the objective function is similar. So yeah, as what I said in the previous slides. Again, logarithm loss. So let's check the result. So what you will observe first is that you no longer have the corner, uh, the same view as in the metric scaling. Namely, for all the three bottom figures, you have a little bit of uh, uh, missing area within the top right region. So for the third class, uh, which is in the bottom right figure, we can see that Instead, adjusting the probability or increase the probability for all the bottom left region, the Dirichlet calibration can effectively only increase the probability within a local region. 
as observed in the data, uh, as you observe in the data set, where actually class three only receive this probability for a very small probability region, while the other two class is being close to zero. So, so one of the key difference for Dirichlet calibration compared to matrix scaling is with the logarithm feature and the treating all the three classes equally, you can have more detailed adjustments locally instead of a general linear adjustment on the logit form. Also, being a Dirichlet distribution is a multi-class generalization of the beta distribution. Dirichlet calibration can also achieve identical calibration map, which means that you know you do not adjust the probability from the original model. And finally, for the function or feature space view, if you check the top three figures, Dirichlet calibration can do pretty well, similar to metric scaling, is adjusting particular class three to uh, more close, to be more close to the true model. Okay, so that's pretty much for the, all the detailed approaches we covered. And now will be a few notable mentions. Since particularly calibration received a lot of interest in these years, so there are many uh, interesting approaches uh, that's trying to tackle the problem from different uh, aspects. Uh, I cannot really cover everything, particularly for some uh, more past development, uh, we believe there will be some good survey paper. So we mainly focus on some recent uh, developed approaches. Please let us know if you think there is anything missing and you would like you know, us to further include in the uh, website after the tutorial is done. Okay, so the first one is from Niani et al, which is actually based on bidding approach. It's from four years ago or five years ago at AAA conference. So from the name, you can pretty much uh, guess what it's about. Instead of you know, giving a binning uh, as specified by the user or isotonic regression, it's actually trying to use a Bayesian approach to infer the binning so that the binning ages as well as the predicted probabilities are regularized or controlled in a Bayesian way. And uh, the second one is from Milios et al, which is called the Dirichlet based Gaussian process for large scale calibrated classification. While both having Dirichlet in its name, this one is actually quite different from the Dirichlet calibration. First of all, this paper mainly focused on a Gaussian process classification case. For those of you who are familiar with Gaussian process classification, since the integration for the latent function is intractable, you have to do MCMC MC variational inference or other approximated uh, inference, which is both slow and can give some drawbacks for the predicted probabilities. So in this paper, the authors argue that since Gaussian per size uh, regression is fairly easy to do, why don't we first do the regression and then we use a Dirichlet inspired link function to further justify the regression model to give calibrated probabilities. So that's this paper from New Rips uh, two years ago. And uh, another three note mentions. So uh, the first is Ali Kiwi and the Ku, which is in last year's ECML, uh, is a Bayesian isotonic uh, calibration. As we saw before, uh, isotonic regression can be is being non-parametric is very, very data-driven, and a certain artifact can be generated, particularly when the data point is not enough. So in this paper, the authors provide a Bayesian approach, which can give a better generalization as well as calibrated results for isotonic regression which is, uh, again, maintaining the simple simpleness of the simplicity of isotonic regression while giving good results. And the second one is trainable calibration measures for neural networks from kernel mean inviting. This one is a uh, special, uh, as it is more different from what, what we have done in this tutorial. We have been focusing on post-hoc calibrators 
meaning that you train the model first and then you calibrate it afterwards. This paper actually introduces a method to uh, reinforce or just to increase the level of calibration during the training process. So a quick summary would be they are trying to put a regularization term, but instead of traditional regularization, they are regularized towards a more calibrated model, which used uh, some approaches from kernel mini body. This was in uh, two years ago, uh, SML. So basically, instead of doing post things, why, how could you achieve more calibrated results from the first place? And another the one from Winger et al. is non-parametric calibration for classification. So as we said, non-parametric approach are generally quite good when the data set is large enough. In this paper, the authors, again, use a Gaussian process inspired approaches to take the advantage of the non-parametric and the kernel distance metric so that you can have better calibrated result from a GP-based model, which is a post hoc calibrator and can be used for any models. And uh, finally, so these are the last three. The first one is Kuleshov et al. Accurate uncertainty is for deep learning using calibrated regression uh, from two years ago, ICML. This one is using isotonic regression to calibrate the quantile of a regression model which in the final slide, Peter will introduce more. So for a regression case, you can also calibrate its probabilities, but you need to consider it from the quantile of the predicted uh, mean and the predicted standard deviation. And uh, another work from our group is uh, in last year's ICML, which is called distribution calibration for regression. This one is more different from the previous one, where the calibration is considered a global quantile level. In this paper, we further consider the problem of calibration for regression in a local distribution manner. Again, uh, Peter and I will introduce this in the uh, conclusion bit. And uh, finally, this one is actually uh, from Wiedemann et al. He, in last year's uh, new rips, it's actually a calibration test instead of uh, calibrators. However, if you recall in the early of the slides, we actually say that a good or a continuous reliability diagram can be actually turned into a good calibration map. So which somehow gives the view that to, give, to provide a good calibrator, you really need a good metric for calibration test. So this one is a uh, more general and the recent paper focused on true multi-class calibration instead of confidence and the class wise ones. So that's why we put here as an inspire, inspiration for future development for calibrators. Okay, uh, so finally some just uh, empirical or uh, experience wise, we give some introduction for regularization and the Bayesian treatments. So the thing is, as you observed before, for certain calibrators, such as Dirichlet or matrix scaling, so with the number of classes increase, increases, you will effectively have a squared increase of number of parameters. Also considering for occasions that you have a fairly small calibration or training set, it can unavoidable to cause some overfitting. So to deal with overfitting, so it depends on whether you are regularization or Bayesian, you can always consider certain you know, uh, regularization approaches. So here we don't particularly uh, give a comparison between different calibration approaches. This need to really be depend, really depends on your original model. And uh, for Bayesian approaches as well, for instance, you can have a zero mean prior, will push the older, coefficient towards zero, or even you can have some fixed priors on other locations as well. However, in our recent work in Dirichlet calibration, we did consider this a bit further to think how could we invent a regularization approach that would be very good for certain calibrator approaches, namely our Dirichlet calibration. 
we and uh, we propose are off diagonal IL2 regularization approach. So by as the name suggests, it is an IL2 regularization. However, you only do that for all the off diagonal components. So for the if you recall, for the slope coefficient, you will have a k by k matrix. So we only regularize the off diagonal bit and then leave the diagonal components unregularized. So the uh, quick intuition is that by doing so, you can limiting the pairwise interaction among different classes. So given the limited time, I cannot cover it here, but you are always welcome to read the original paper. And finally, some implementation tricks. So particular, so while the other, while the previous slides are mainly focusing on the calibrators, there are also certain things you can do when you're actually writing a calibrator yourself. First thing, which can be seen back to the plot scaling paper, is that having multiple intervals to train the base model and the calibrator separately, for instance, you can divide your training site into three folds. Each time you use two folds to train a base model and use the rest uh, uh, fold to train your calibrator and you do a cross, uh, do it in a cross way. In fact, eventually you will result it in three pairs of base model and the calibrators. And during the prediction time, you can have the averages from these three pairs of model calibrators. This can be seen as a way to improve the level of calibration and the improve of the generalization, which can be seen as a special way uh, compared with uh, regularization and basic approaches we just introduced. Another thing uh, we part partially covered before, approaches include beta, Dirichlet, and the metric scaling. They are all generalized linear models. And uh, since they are using uh, softmax or logist uh, logistic link function, you don't necessarily need to write your own code. As long as you can extract a corresponding logarithm feature or log it feature, you can just throw it into a logistic regression. So they are fairly easy to do. And finally is another important message for calibrators with a convex loss. Uh, a good example would be the Dirichlet one and the matrix scaling where it was based on a logistic regression where the loss function is proven to be convex. When the number of data points and the classes is manageable, for instance, you don't have 1000 classes, See, then you can, because your parameter vector will, or your number of parameters will be lim of limited, you can actually figure out the Hessian matrix and then apply explicit Newton gradient descent approaches. So that the final result will be actually better in terms of calibration, because now you are considered a globe, global convex loss and uh, you get your gradient descent explicitly by the Hessian matrix, and uh, which can ensure the convergence of the whole algorithm. This is normally better than scholastic gradient descent. Uh, so where you, each time you only apply a batch or a mini batch of the data set, and it can cause some randomness, but occasionally can even cause your calibrator or base models to be uncalibrated from the first place. But you have to do scholastic gradient descent when you have you do have a lot of data points cannot fit into memory, or you have a lot of class, which means your parameter is a lot, and uh, the Hessian matrix might be one million by one million. We don't believe anyone has the supercomputer can do that. Okay, so yeah, the finally conclusion slides. So lessons learned. So to give a quick conclusion. Let's ask yourself a couple, a series of questions. Do you care the entire probability vector or about a single class? For image classification, do you care about all the, you know, 1000 or even more classes on ImageNet, or you just want cat images? If you only cat a particular class, you are welcome to do binary approaches or class-wise calibration. You don't really care about others. And the second question is, do you have a large calibration slash training set? If the answer is yes, consider non-parametric approaches. They are normally better with large, large training set, as long as your computer can handle, of course. Again, do you have a small calibration site? 
if the answer is yes, you need to consider parametric approach as well as regularization because you don't want your calibrator to overfit. And the final question, are you only interested in certain probability values? For instance, uh, for a binary case, do you care about all the values from zero to one, all the places, or just like to see the probability of 0 0.5 to be calibrated? If the answer is yes, you only you care certain probability values, you are welcome to consider binning approaches. Although it can only give discrete uh, probabilities, as we said before, it can be quite accurate for a small region of the entire probability space. And I will take uh, other questions uh, in the question session. And uh, thanks. I think now it's time to do some questions. Hi, Hal. Um, thanks for that. It was very um, illuminating and useful. I see one question from Hoover, which is, I guess, partially answered in this slide, which is, will data size affect calibrator performance, for instance, binary imbalanced data set? Yes, uh, definitely, yes. For instance, particularly for unbalanced data size, you don't really have many observations at all. In this case, you all non-parametric approaches, of, co of course, no. And even for binning approaches, you don't really trust the counting with the beans. In this particular case, I will strongly suggest that you first do not compute any regularization, just try a calibration approach. And then you do a recursive manner. Each time you, you check your uh, result from the calibrator to see whether it is uncalibrated in a special manner. Then you come back to put your prior knowledge into your regularization or Bayesian uh, setup and to see the final result will be fixed. I mean, although this can potentially give you some overfitting toward, towards the final result, but you know, when you don't have a lot of data sites at our uh, data point, there's no better thing you can do but to put your personal experience or prior knowledge into it. Thank you. 